Hello there. <clears throat> this lecture today is a lecture about the um, changes that happened in art in the late 1950s and early 1960s in America. You should have already listened to the lecture where I talked about Nouveau Realism and Arte Povera in Europe, and we're going to look at some sort of cognate things that are happening in the late 50s and early 60s with a slightly younger group of artists who are coming to New York um, <clears throat> in the, the late 50s, early 60s and the influences they're bringing with them. Uh, we're going to see a shift in these younger painters and artists fra away from the kind of intense psychological personal meaning that the abstract expressionist generation really imbued into their paintings to um, um, a kind of different way of looking at meaning in art. And the two painters that we're going to look, or the two artists we're going to look at primarily who really represent this movement are um, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. Rauschenberg just died this past summer. Jasper Johns is still around. Uh, these guys got the nickname the Neo-Dadaists. Uh, Dada, remember, is the name of Marcel Duchamp's movement in the 19-teens and 20s that is this kind of, uh, and again, this should all start to sound really familiar, especially after the last couple of lectures. This movement in the 19-teens and 20s that questions art traditions, that uses found objects or ready-made objects, as Marcel Duchamp called them, in, um, in creation of art, that questions the whole concept of aesthetics, that's going to be something that you're going to also see in the neo-Dadaists or the new Dadaists, Jasper Johns and, Rauschen and Robert Rauschenberg in the 1950s and early 60s. So the two painters, as I was saying, Rauschenberg here, um, oh, that should be updated, that slide, because he just died last summer, 1925 to 2008. Rauschenberg's got this famous quote, Painting relates to both art and life. Neither can be made. I try to act in that gap between the two. Here again, this is something quite different than the abstract expressionists, where Rauschenberg is going to be really interested in collapsing the distinctions between the fine art and other stuff, the rest of life. Uh, Jasper John, similarly, as we'll see. Those are the two painters we're going to be talking about. You also, also should know this name, John Cage. He's a composer and uh, another artist you should know, a choreographer, who is part of this group, is a composer, choreographer named Merce Cunningham, M-E-R-C-E, -E, Merce Cunningham, C-U-N-N-I-N-G, H-A-M, Cunningham. Merce Cunningham, who was a composer, or excuse me, choreographer, and John Cage, who is a composer. Both of them will work with Johns and Rauschenberg at different points, collaborating. In fact, Rauschenberg was the stage manager for Merce Cunningham's dance company in the early 1960s and uh, continued to design sets for them for a long time. So lots of collaboration. And then John Cage Went to school with Rauschenberg. Um, Jasper Johns also did sets for Merce Cunningham. I mean, these guys all kind of worked together, shared ideas, and had some influence on one another. And again, the movement that we're talking about that these guys belong to is so-called Neo-Dada. Here's an early painting by Robert Rauschenberg that was actually created when he was a student at this experimental college in North Carolina called Black Mountain College. Black Mountain College in, in North Carolina was this kind of small art school that had hired a bunch of really impressive people, including Joseph Albers, who had been one of the lead teachers at the Bauhaus in Germany before he had to escape Hitler uh, during World War II. So Joseph Albers was actually Robert Rauschenberg's painting teacher at Black Mountain College. And we'll meet Albers again. Uh, some of you took... European art last semester will recognize the name, but um, we will see Albers again when we talk about minimalism because he's a big important influence on that movement. He's also an influence on guys like Robert Rauschenberg with his very um, strict adherence to the idea of um, formal qualities in art. Later, Rauschenberg would say, that Albers inspired him most by encouraging, by inspiring him to go in completely the opposite direction. So kind of an interesting thing to keep in mind. So here's an early painting by Rauschenberg. It's a seven panel painting and it's just completely flat white canvases. Rauschenberg's idea was that you would hang these in a gallery and the 
the paintings would change over the course of the day depending upon the time of day, the light, the ambient light coming in from outside, whether or not somebody was standing in front of the painting and casting a shadow, uh, so that it was a kind of constantly variable use of accident and chance, found objects, the light, the shadow, um, to create a constant, and of course viewer interaction, to create a constantly changing painting. You can love this or hate this, okay, but I want you to understand what the idea is here. This should sound familiar. We've seen the Goutage group thinking about chance and audience participation. We've seen this with Marcel Duchamp, so it's something that's an ongoing, uh, ongoing thing. John Cage, by the way, the composer, <laughs> and I, I've got a couple of YouTube links to some of his, um, an interview with him and some of his stuff being performed to give you a sense of what kind of music he was making. Um, John Cage said that this is what inspired him to create his most famous piece, a, a piece of music called 4 Minutes and 33 Seconds. In that piece, the script or the, the, the um, sheet music for 4 Minutes 33 Seconds basically has the bars measured out and the instructions are for a pianist to come out, sit down on the stage, and sit at the piano for that entire time, 4 minutes and 33 seconds without doing anything. Uh, when this piece was first performed, as you might imagine, you know, after about 15 seconds, people start wondering what's up, what's going on, why isn't this guy playing, you know, the audience starts to murmur, people start shuffling through their programs to read a description of this piece, um, people are unwrapping cough drops or coughing, people start to get upset, there's talk, there's chatter, there's all sorts of ambient noise from the audience. That is the piece of music. It's the audience-generated, time-limited, um, one-time-only, chance assemblage of whoever happens to be there and however they happen to react to four minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, and actually, Cage said he was directly inspired by Rauschenberg's white paintings. They were both students at Black Mountain College together. So this is a different use of the idea of chance or accident or unpremeditated um, uh, performance than we'd seen with the earlier action painters like Jackson Pollock, right? This is a taking a completely different, really, approach to that problem of premeditation and self-expression versus um, versus complete freedom, right? So this is a this is the uh, <clears throat> this is the kind of background here. When these white paintings were exhibited in New York, Cage, <clears throat> John Cage, the composer, wrote a statement for them. He said, "No subject, no image, no taste, no object, no beauty, no message, no talent, no technique, no idea." And this generation is going to really kind of glom onto that idea that traditional definitions of artist and art are dead and that we need to go in some sort of new direction and some concept and process and all these things are going to be much more important. Um, that is all kind of at the heart of what's going on in this in this neo-Dadaist movement. And I'm sure that you can hear echoes of Marcel Duchamp in these things. Another one of Rauschenberg's early kind of conceptual pieces that stirred up some interest and still can manage to make people really mad is this work right here and I've got a little interview with them <clears throat> with him about this um, erased de Kooning drawing he went to Willem de Kooning remember big figural abstract expressionist the guy who did woman one really really by the 1950s super famous guy and Rauschenberg is just a young guy he hasn't really made a name for himself yet he's just coming on the scene he goes to de Kooning and says to him you know I'd really like to take one of your drawings and erase it and make that into my uh, work of art. And de Kooning really liked the idea, so he kind of went through his pile of drawings and prints and multimedia works and um, found an, a, a piece of paper. We don't know what it looked like because there was no photographic record of it, but anyway, he <laughs> took a drawing, gave it to Rauschenberg, and it was apparently a pretty dense drawing that was pretty heavily layered with different um, materials because it took Rauschenberg about a month of uh, work to erase the drawing and when he was finally done he had it framed and he had his friend and fellow neo-dadaist Jasper Johns make the frame and make the little label that you can just barely see in this reproduction 
uh, that says it's Robert Rauschenberg's erased de Kooning drawing and dated 1953. So this kind of <clears throat> collaborative, um, destructive, um, liberating act is the kind of thing that is going to be typical of these neo-Dadaist artists. And in fact, <clears throat> Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, when they came to New York, they became friends quickly and they not only collaborated with um, the choreographer Merce Cunningham at various points or with John Cage, but the two of them also worked together. They were um, window dressers for downtown department stores together. So that was sort of their day jobs while they were making their mark on the, the scene of the art world. What really got people's attention for Ra Rauschenberg was this object here, which is at the Museum of Modern Art. It is a <clears throat> very large painting on a bed sheet and quilt and pillow. So it's non-traditional materials, <clears throat> excuse me, found objects even that, I mean, the story goes, part of Rauschenberg's explanation for this was he was too poor to afford canvas. And so he just used any old thing he could find, including his own bed. Um, it may be a little more complicated than that too, because he seems to want to include all sorts of, you know, break down that boundary between art and life, act in the gap between the two. So painting your bed and putting it up on the wall, the mattress isn't here, okay? It's just the sheets and, um, and quilt that are stretched like a canvas would be, um, and the pillow tacked on there. This kind of quasi-sculpture, quasi-painting combination of objects, of found objects, really, uh, Rauschenberg called these combines. So they're not really paintings, they're not really sculpture, they're kind of both. Um, and the legend has that this is, the, the bed sheets here, the bedding is actually Rauschenberg's own when he was, when he was too poor to afford um, painting. He also would, you know, go around the city and collect junk um, and bring it back to the studio to use uh, and incorporate into his art. He said partly because this was, you know, a cheap way to make art, but also, I mean, he was quite well aware of the Dadaists and Marcel Duchamp and the whole sort of philosophical reason why you might reject traditional aesthetics and go out and pick up stuff off the street or, you know, buy stuff at the store and then turn that into your art. This is the <clears throat> painting that really, or the combine painting that really got Rauschenberg noticed. When it was first exhibited, there were people who were really offended by it. I mean, there's all that blood red paint there around the midsection of the quilt um, with its kind of drippy, and you can see also, I think, probably an homage to or, or relevance to abstract expressionism, all this drippy paint kind of pouring over the canvas and smeared over the canvas have at least for some viewers, had this kind of connotation of anything from sexual activity to murder having happened in this bed, okay? You know, dripping bodily fluids or whatnot. So um, it really got people's attention. And as you can see, it's really something quite different than the abstract expressionists, this combination of, of materials, this kind of mundaneness. It's referential. It looks a little bit like a bed except that it's on the wall. Uh, very different than the kind of stuff that Mark Rothko, for example, is doing. Rauschenberg was also kind of hooked into the current, you know, art scene in Europe as well. And uh, he was invited to participate in a show at the Iris Clare Gallery. Iris Clare is the woman who had exhibited Eve Klein and we had the party where everybody was drinking blue cocktails, you know. Um, so she was really kind of a, a leading avant-garde art dealer. So Rauschenberg got ex uh, invited to contribute to a, a show of portraits at her gallery. There would be portraits of Iris Clare. And this is what he submitted. A telegram. He happened to be traveling, I think, in Sweden, and he sent this to uh, Clare's hotel in Paris. And the, the telegram says, this is a portrait of, of Iris Clare, if I say so, signed Robert Rauschenberg. Okay, so that should sound so familiar, so Marcel Duchamp, right? 
uh, it's the artist's choice that makes something what it is. It's the artist giving a new thought to a an object. Um, it's a rejection of traditional media and materials. It is a kind of questioning of or playing with the idea of artistic authority. So this is another way in which Robert Rauschenberg is a, a really good example of Neo Dada and the kind of resurrection of Marcel Duchamp and his group's ideas about art and, um, and the art market and whatnot. Here also around the same time Rauschenberg is doing these combine paintings, there's another combine. This is uh, the so-called canyon from 1959, which is a combination of collage. So you've got some, you know, cutouts and newspaper things pasted onto the surface of the canvas uh, and paint obviously smeared and splashed and dripped on the canvas. And you also have a stuffed raven that has been affixed to the front of the canvas and then a bed pillow that's been hung um, on a, a twine on a nail on the uh, coming off of the canvas. So here again, combine painting or combine object because it is sculpture, it is assemblage, it's collage, it is not just a two-dimensional surface, it's this weird three-dimensional thing that bursts out of the two-dimensional picture frame and um, kind of destroying the traditional idea of what a painting is supposed to be. A breakdown of traditional genres in the combine painting. There And there is obviously some kind of corollaries to abstract expressionism that you can see in the style there, especially the painted part of this object. But again, he's kind of going beyond what guys like Jackson Pollock were doing. I mean, we saw early on Jackson Pollock embedded stuff like, you know, bottle caps and coins into his paintings, but here, uh, there, those things became obscured and they became a kind of secret part of the overall composition, and here they're becoming very prominent. And incorporating stuff you wouldn't normally think of, uh, and then also having these weird connotations or negative connotations. Some people have compared that pillow to the idea of a, a noose around uh, the neck of a condemned person, the raven traditionally a symbol of death. Uh, so what, you know, what exactly, if any symbolism is meant to be going on here, has been open for debate. This is his monogram. It's called Monogram from 1955 to 59, so it was a several year project. And this is a stuffed angora goat that has been covered in paint, various parts have been painted. Uh, it's wearing an automobile tire and it's standing on a painted platform. Behind the goat there is actually, I don't know if I have a shot of it or not, I might right here. Yeah, here we go. There's a tennis ball that's been painted brown, so a little bit of scatological humor there with this idea of, you know, the <clears throat> goat that has just um, taken a, a crap on the painting, basically. It's not sculpture. It's not painting. It's a combine of both, really. And it's using ready-made objects, putting them into a new context to make a work of art. Here's just a nice close-up of the painted part of the goat from the uh, monogram. So, you know, it's the artist taking it and putting it in a new context and making a new thought for the object. That is the kind of hallmark of Rauschenberg's combines, which again is resurrecting some of the ideas of Marcel Duchamp and Dada. And as you can see, I mean, this is kind of going in a new direction from the pure painting of the abstract expressionist generation. Remember, they wanted their paintings to be complete objects in and of themselves. And here you've got a very different, much more playful kind of approach to art. Uh, and Rauschenberg himself often said, you know, he really wasn't into that kind of psychologizing. He really kind of wanted to just enjoy making stuff. Uh, legend has it that one of the abstract expressionist painters came to see an early show in which Robert Rauschenberg was exhibiting combines and said, if this is modern art, I want nothing to do with it. You know, the feeling that a guy like Rauschenberg was destroying the purity of modern art or the quality of modern art and turning it into this kind of um, trash filled, you know, jokey extravaganza. And you can decide for yourself as the course goes along which uh, one of these 
um, sides of the argument ended up winning in the, the sort of contemporary art scene. Here's another example of his combines where you can see they're, you know, reminiscent of things that Marcel Duchamp would have done, a uh, kind of combination of collage, two-dimensional art, three-dimensional construction. In this case, there's actually a stuffed chicken there in the uh, bottom of this untitled combine. It's not really sculpture. It's not really painting. It's not really photography. It's not really craft. It's kind of a hybrid. It's kind of its own thing. Uh, these combines. And that, again, is part of what Rauschenberg contributes to the um, overall conversation. He goes on to do all sorts of interesting collages and large-scale paintings, but I just wanted to show you a sampling of his early work because this period of the, the late 50s and early 60s is an important turning point, which, as we will see, in the direction in which contemporary art will go. His, Rauschenberg's great friend and sometimes collaborator and co-worker, who was also friends with, ja or with um, John Cage and Merce Cunningham and also heavily influenced by Marcel Duchamp, is this guy named Jasper Johns. Uh, Johns from South Carolina originally and still living and one of the most right now um, expensive living artists. This was the painting that made his breakthrough. It is a painting from 1955 called simply Flag, probably for obvious reasons in that it is a replication of an American flag. This is a <clears throat> encaustic, uh, I believe on wood panel. Encaustic is a different medium than oil painting. You use hot wax, you suspend the pigment in hot wax, and then you paint with the hot wax. And if you've ever played with candle wax, for example, you know that this stuff cools fairly quickly, but like you can really layer it on nice and thick and get a lot of texture. And also that it tends to be translucent, so it dries, <clears throat> not completely opaque. So if you've put something under the surface, you can really see it in the, in the um, object. So here, instead of literally taking like a stuffed goat from a taxidermy shop or something, or a used tire off the street, his found object is the iconography. And Johns will do lots and lots of these um, paintings. He starts out doing flags and flags in different color combinations, where for him, the flag is not a flag. It's not something that he's painting because he's got deep, patri I mean, he may have deep patriotic feelings, but that's not why he chose the flag. He says, it is so familiar and so commonplace and so you see this iconography everywhere so much that it almost has no meaning, no intrinsic meaning. And so if you do these paintings of it over and over and over, the painting can transcend whatever it is it's representing and become kind of an object in and of itself. I mean, you can take that with a grain of salt if you want, but his that was what he said. He was very interested to um, take some iconography that could become so repetitive as to be meaningless and then make some interesting objects out of that. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a close-up of Flag from 1955, so you can see the very thickly textured and caustic uh, paint on the top of the uh, surface of the canvas. And as you can see, underneath that, uh, in all the red strips of the flag, there are actually pieces of newspaper that are pasted in. And this is a pretty close-up view of Flag. Uh, <clears throat> here, I mean, he's doing another thing that is important for this Neo-Dada group, and that is combining high and low, um, you know, the, the fine art technique of painting with the everyday trash of the newspaper or the everyday symbolism of the flag. And I'm looking for a good quote from him on this. Yeah, he's just, you know, and actually in a lot of interviews, John sort of denies that his paintings have any deeper meaning. So he doesn't paint a flag because he's got any particular agenda about the flag, just because it's something that's there that is useful to paint.
So here's another one of his flags from the 1950s. This one's at, I believe, at the Met. And here you can see it's still an American flag, but he's bled all the color out of it. So it's this kind of monochromatic um, shades of white and cream and gray image. And he does these over and over and over again. And again, mostly because it was so simple and so familiar that it you could stop thinking about what was on the painting and think about the, the what was in the painting, if that makes sense. Here's another example of the sort of very familiar iconography that Jasper Johns would take and then turn into um, pieces of art. He did a whole series of Target paintings in the 1950s too. This is well before the company Target, so these are Targets in the old-fashioned sense of bullseyes. And <clears throat> he is an early example of what will become common in pop art too, not only using these very common uh, references to everyday objects, almost like found iconography, but also, uh, and also incorporating different media. So here across the top of the target, he's got four different casts of one of his friend's faces uh, that have been put onto this, um, collapsing the boundaries between high and low. He's really kind of a forerunner of some of the pop artists we'll look at in the 1960s with this kind of stuff. Oh, and repetition of single forms and things like that. Here's a close-up of that painting, and there you can see again that he's pasted newspaper uh, underneath the surface of the encaustic that he's painted the target with. Lots of people have tried to figure out what exactly is going on in, um, <clears throat> in those fragments and whether they mean anything. In this one, the little fragment that you can just barely see, the headline says, History and Biography, but it's not really clear whether they were meant to have any specific deep meanings or if it was just this was the newspaper he had from that day, and so that was what went up on his painting. Here's another um, John's sort of pop arty um, neo data idea. In the 1950s and 60s, paint by numbers kits became incredibly popular across the country, and he's referencing this in this painting called Do It Yourself Target. So he's got the outlines and the paint numbers there. You can just barely see it in this reproduction for a person to come along and make their own target. And then he's got the little palettes of paint so that you could actually, you know, wet that brush and then go ahead and fill in the outlines with according to the right numbers and create your own version of one of his paintings. So here again, playing with, you know, a hierarchy of art versus craft. Uh, of artist with a capital A versus hobbyist. Uh, and this was actually, you know, kind of a big deal in the 1960s. I mean, the, the slogan, the famous the slogan of the most successful of these paint by numbers companies was every man a Rembrandt, you know? So there's a kind of interesting play going on here with this. And of course, it's signed by Jasper Johns. So it's a little bit like it would become a collaboration if you stepped in and did the paint by numbers part. Um, it's unique. It's not an actual mass-produced canvas that you can buy and fill in yourself. So it's playing with all of those ideas of the found object and whatnot in reverse. And um, uh, just a good sort of example of neo-dada. And again, a little bit of pop art as well. I mean, Jasper Johns is a little hard to categorize. Sometimes people like to call him one of the forerunners of pop art. And I, I don't have any objection to that, although we're going to just say he's neo-dada for our purposes for the test. Johns also will take the legacy of Marcel Duchamp quite seriously. He actually went to Philadelphia where they have a really good collection of Marcel Duchamp pieces because of a, a relationship Duchamp had with a collector in Philadelphia in the early 20th century. So the Philadelphia Museum has one of the best Marcel Duchamp collections out there. And uh, he went there and he was really, Johns did, and he was really impressed by what he saw. And really all these artists in the 50s and 60s Duchamp was still around. He was kind of an elder statesman by then, but he was having retrospectives. He was still in the newspapers. People were still interviewing him, and he actually got to know a lot of these guys. He eventually met Johns and Rauschenberg, too, 
And um, so his ideas were still really percolating through the art marketplace, so to speak. And so here's John's playing with the concept of the ready-made, where he's bought a commercially available light bulb at a hardware store and then had it cast in bronze. Bronze casting, of course, traditionally belonging to the fine art, high art media. Uh, but here, instead of sculpting something that then gets cast, he's just purchased a mass-produced object and had that made into this bronze artifact. So again, the boundary between high and low, the question of artistic creativity and craft and ability, all of these things being um, called into question. Same thing going on here, and again, you know, also with the use of advertising, uh, illustration, and the idea of the found object and the boundaries between high and low. Here, two cans of beer that have been cast in bronze and then have been painted to have a replica of their original logo. Uh, you know, trash, basically, stuff that you would normally throw away or now recycle, being turned into bronze sculpture. So, collapse in you know, the effluvia of everyday life, not even something pr that, to be a little kitschy, but something that you might think of as more meaningful, like a person's baby shoe or something being bronzed. This is just, you know, um, stuff that you would normally throw away. He also was very playful in the painting that he does during this time. So here's large-scale painting this is an encaustic and collage, so it's got some newspaper and magazine cutouts buried in the underneath the paint and encaustic there. Uh, this is about 65 inches tall, so it's a pretty, and 54 inches wide, so pretty large scale panel painting that has this kind of, you know, sexualized reference here. Painting with two balls, and there you can see the two balls in that opening between the first two panels at the top there. And people have written a lot about the sexual connotations of the two balls in that opening there. And I'll let you think about what possible connotations could be there. But here I think what you can see is how there's a shift from, even though there's some affinities with abstract expressionism, those very big blotchy areas of paint not representing anything in particular, very expressively applied to the canvas, a la Willem de Kooning, for example. Here you have this playful, jokey reference, right? Uh, painting with two balls, and you actually have the title of the painting stenciled across the bottom and signed uh, and dated. The kind of thing that a Rothko or a de Kooning or a <clears throat> Pollock would never have done because, you know, those paintings were meant to be these self-contained experiences. They weren't meant to be, and they were meant to be very serious and very psychological and very deep. And here you've got something that seems to be the opposite, something that's meant to be kind of goofy and silly. And if it's got Freudian references, they're meant to be much more jokey than anything you would see in the abstract expressionists. Here, um, Johns also does these very kind of <clears throat> monochromatic paintings, and he'll continue to do this in printmaking as well, these kind of large-scale gray paintings. This is a another encaustic painting and it's uh, been scraped by using that ruler that's affixed there. Uh, as you can see the trajectory that it's traced. The empty inverted tin cup, the whole idea of like loss. Um, this is actually a painting from the year in which Rauschenberg and John's collaboration fell apart and they stopped talking. And so this kind of mournful coloring, this kind of sad, um, <clears throat> this sort of sad elegiac feeling to this painting may have something to do with the fact that he and Rauschenberg had essentially broken up. Let's see. Uh, oh, John's also here. Again, you know, you can see where there's affinities and breaks with the abstract expressionist movement. The interest of later painters and artists in the pop art period is going to be with stuff like lettering and advertising and signage and stenciling and that seems to be something that he's touching on here in this painting the um, periscope here 
is that little that circular area to the top right of the painting uh, it has something to do with um, well Hart Crane actually committed suicide by diving into the Gulf of Mexico and never coming up again and so there may be some sort of reference to depression suicide mortality um, that kind of thing going on here let's see okay uh, I just did want to mention too again Jasper Johns collaborated with uh, <clears throat> and was inspired by the same groups of people that Rauschenberg was and that are going to be so influential for lots of the 20th century later 20th century Johns designed the set pieces for a piece of choreography called walk around time that was choreographed by Merce Cunningham Merce Cunningham had created Walk Around Time as a kind of dance illustration of Marcel Duchamp's theories. And I couldn't find a good clip online for you, but you can just imagine it's sort of mid-century modern dance, and the dancers are dancing around these set pieces here. These set pieces are actually inspired by the actual uh, an actual work of art in Philadelphia by Marcel Duchamp called The Large Glass. And I've got a picture of it here to show you the relationship. First, there's the Cunningham dancers in action with the set pieces from uh, Jasper John's large glass and then there's the set pieces on the right and then the large glass itself on the left so you can see where he's taken elements out of the large glass and then turned them into these large kind of flexible inflatable um, plastic set pieces that are directly referential to elements of this um, picture by Marcel Duchamp that is the end of my tour through the neo-dadaists and I hope that what you can take away from this is the continued relevance of some of Marcel Duchamp's most radical ideas the way that painting and sculpture are turning away from the kind of very high-minded modernism of the immediate post-war period how across the board in this later period of the 50s and 60s some of those high art categories are going to be challenged and broken down how the idea of concept itself is going to reemerge as something really important by the time we get to beyond pop art you're going to really see this as a dominant trend in the contemporary period so these neo dadaists in Rauschenberg and Johns in particular are really important for marking the beginning of this tidal turn away from abstract expressionism towards other concerns within the realm of art making and when I see you next time we will um, talk a little bit about minimalism which is one of the ways in which art turns in the 1960s